Texas was already making waves and protecting the pre-born via their novel heartbeat law, which used a, a new citizen enforcement model. Because of that model, the abortion lobby could find no one to sue to stop the law from taking effect. And so it went into effect actually September 1st, 2021, saving countless babies with audible heartbeats. Following Roe's reversal, Texas is now numbered among the states with total abortion bans. Today's guest, Sylvia Johnson, is at ground zero for the effort to support women um, in Texas, where some abortions sadly are still happening, and many of them are happening via chemical abortion. She is the CEO of Houston Pregnancy Help Center, and they have three locations in this major metropolitan era. So today we're going to have a serious conversation about what's happening on the ground in one of our biggest cities in the state of Texas. So stay tuned. Hey guys, this is Autumn Higashi, Students for Life spokesperson, jumping on Explicitly Pro-Life to let you know about a very special event coming up that we need you to join. This Valentine's Day, we are asking the Walgreens CEO to love them both, the mother and the child, and to stop distributing chemical abortion pills. Women and children deserve better than these deadly abortion drugs that are responsible for the deaths of nearly 30 women and millions of preborn babies. So I'm asking you to please visit studentsforlife.org forward slash abortion cartel to get more information about joining our February 14th protest online or in person and see about hosting your own local pharmacy protest on March 4th. We cannot let our pharmacies become abortion facilities. Thank you. Hey, Pro-Life Jen, it's Kristen Hawkins. Welcome to this episode of the Explicitly Pro-Life Podcast. We've got a lot to talk about today. First, I'm going to introduce my guest, Sylvia Johnson. Sylvia is the CEO of Houston Pregnancy Help Center, which currently has three locations in Houston, Texas. Fifth Ward Pregnancy Help Center located on the center of Shotwell and East Freeway, the Downtown Pregnancy Help Center located in San Jacinto and Alabama, and the new medical mobile van, which serves the greater Houston era. Area. Sir, Sylvia has served as a pregnancy help center director for the past 35 years and has opened five pregnancy centers, insisting with the opening of two others. These centers provide services to over 10,000 clients a year. Under her leadership, medical services were implemented in her pregnancy centers there in Houston, and she is known as the encourager, a woman of vision, and most importantly, a woman that loves God and his people. And just before we get to Sylvia, I just want to let you all know, the first and only time I met Sylvia in person was the day of the Dobbs leak on May 2nd. I will never forget our meeting. It was at, uh, um, La, what, oh, it was at the Ma La Madeline, the French restaurant. I know I was so mad about how much it cost for my eggs that morning, but this woman is a power. So everyone said, you've got to meet when you're in Houston, you have to meet Sylvia and hear what she she's doing with the pregnancy center movement, hear what she's doing to stop chemical abortion pills from flowing into Houston. And she is just this incredible force for nature. So Sylvia, thank you for coming on Explicitly Pro-Life. It is awesome to be here, Kristen. You're one of my sheroes. I admire you, your voice, your boldness, your courage has inspired me over the years. And um, I tell you what, you are a force to be reckoned and you have given me the courage and the insight to go hard at what I do every day. Hard for lives, hard for unborn babies, hard for the moms. Well, I mean, I just, I think back to our conversation uh, on May 2nd and we were talking a lot about a post row America what it was going to look like. Little did either one of us know was that night a pro-abortion person, the Supreme Court would leak the decision telling us that Roe and Back was going to be reversed. But you had already been working on this with your pregnancy center movement in Houston. Um, I, I don't know. I have a lot of questions to ask you, but I guess the first one would be, what's the difference on the ground? So from May until now, what is the difference now in this post row era, you know, especially in Texas, where you have this very stringent uh, abortion law that's in place that's preventing surgical abortions? Are abortions still happening? How are they happening? What's going on? Okay, I can tell you two things right off the bat. 
One is that I didn't realize that the pro-abortion industry would go as hard as they are right now, targeting minority women at such an accelerated rate, sponsoring their trips out of state, giving them support and financial support. And uh, uh, it's just amazing to me to see that they will, there's nothing that will stop them. They would go to unimaginable lengths to, um, to offer this woman the murder of her innocent baby, the murder of her child. It, it's just mind blowing. The second thing that I've noticed is, and of course we always knew this in the pro-life movement that very rarely was it the woman's decision. I mean, most of the time she was being pressured by outside forces, whether it be the father, the mother, or, or some other circumstance. But right now the relief that's on the, on the moms to be, uh, faces that this law is there to take away that pressure, uh, to take away uh, being forced into terminating a pregnancy that she does not really want to, to terminate. So that those are two things that I'm seeing right off the bat. Uh, one other uh, mention is the abortion pill industry, how it's coming in illegally through um, the uns unsecured borders, um, online pills, um, all of these things that are happening right now, uh, which is making us more, more shopper and more aware, more, more, um, in tune and, um, providing services to combat all of these, um, horrible things that's trying to go against the unborn baby and the mother uh, of that child. I want to back up a little what you said about the relief that women are feeling. Um, because I think what we hear from the abortion industry all the time is that if there are laws, restrictive laws in, in the state that ban abortion, prevent most abortions, that women will be so desperate, they'll go to the back alleys, they're going to self-abort, they're going to die because they have to have abortions in order to succeed. But what you're saying is totally different, that they're feeling relief that they don't have to make that decision. Right. Absolutely. And remember the abortion industry, the bottom line is the dollar bill. What they're really saying is we, we need we need the money from the slaughter of these innocent children. We need the money for exploiting these women. We need those funds. And um, and we knew that we knew that all the time. The world didn't come to an end. There wasn't this apocalypse. Uh, when the decision was overturned. Abortion is not legal in the state of Texas and we haven't fallen apart. Of course, the strategy has changed. The battle has changed. The battlefield looks a little bit different, but I want to tell you, it is awesome to know that there will be children experiencing their first Christmas this year because of the fight that we never gave up on, that we believe God for, that the Supreme Court had the courage, that the Texas legislators had the courage to make sure that these women are protected and children can live. Mm, that's, that's so right. I was, um, I was astonished, I guess you could say I was reading this Newsweek article not long ago where they were talking about there's this diaper shortage in America, you know, like how Joe Biden also gave us a formula shortage and no one cared about it. Uh, but the, but the writer was blaming the pro-life movement and pregnancy centers. <laughs> for the diaper shortage in America. And so the solution wasn't make more diapers. The solution ended up being we need to stop passing pro-life laws, stop ensuring pregnancy centers have diapers to give out, and we need to kill more babies. It was unbelievable, yeah. the argument um, that we're hearing. But I think backing that up, think about the numbers of children who had scheduled death dates who are now going to have birth dates. I mean, it's unimaginable for so many of us. Mm -hmm. it's the thing that we win at, we, we've heard this before, we were told we're Christians. We believe in that every child is created in the image of God. And we believe that God provides. We were told a long time ago to make brick without straw. And we survived that. We did, you know. So to tell us that we're the, the, the blame for the formula shortage and the diaper shortage, what a, what a, what a, what a low, uh, such a low blow uh, to the people who have helped millions of women without any charge for their services day in and day out across this nation. You would never find the compassion, the love, the support that's in pregnancy centers across this nation right now um, for women that are in true crisis situations. It is us. 
It's what we do every day. And we love what we do. We're happy to do it. And we want to do more of it. We practice. I've been doing this for 38 years. We've been practicing for 38 years for this day to come. Now the real work begins. And we're excited to be those midwives providing services to women who are in need of our services. That's so right. That's That's absolutely so right. So I guess tell me what... I guess tell the world, because I know, but I pretend like I don't know sometimes when I do these interviews. Tell me what you've done that's so innovative and revolutionary in Houston. Tell the world, Sylvia, about the chemical abortion clinic and what you guys are doing. Great. I'm excited to announce that we're opening the very first of its kind uh, standalone abortion pill reversal clinic as a template, as a pilot project for other pregnancy centers as laws begin to change across the states to sort of copy our model of having the abortion pill reversal standalone services for women who um, who are involved in the chemical abortion. At our banquet a couple of weeks ago, we had a table full of babies who were saved in that process. When the media and uh, the pro-abortion industry tried to tell us that it's not true science, there was right there children that you could hold and see and touch and cuddle who was in the process of uh, their mothers ending their lives and the courage that the mother had to reach out and find us. By the way, Google has forbidden us from advertising the abortion pill reversal. So these standalone clinics in the hood and the hood has its own internet that's faster than any fiber internet, it'll spread, it's gonna do that. So that's one of the things that we're doing is that standalone abortion pill reversal clinic. The second innovative um, service that we're providing is that we're opening a bridge to life center in Houston for women who are pregnant and need resources. This would not be a pregnancy center model. It will not be medical service. It's just for that woman that needs medical care. She needs housing. She needs support, clothes. She needs childcare. Um, she needs educational services. So if she's pregnant in this, in the city of Houston, she can come to this, this, this resource center and have her very own pregnancy assistant. Uh, throughout her pregnancy and until her child is 36 months old. We're excited about that. We've already hired four pregnancy case managers to to um, staff that location, and they are experts in connecting her to boots on the ground, resources that will, a- will enable her to be successful with this pregnancy. And as an African-American woman, I can tell you uh, that we are also very interested in including the fathers in on this process. The abortion industry told us a long time ago, uh, to my community especially, that abortion was gonna solve our problems. We'll take a look at it 50 years later and look at my communities. Look at where we're located. Look at the devastation that abortion has caused. It is an evil like no other. And this is the biggest curse, I think, that has tried to enter into the minds and hearts of not only our entire society, but especially people of color. So we're, we have a lot of work to do. We're going to do it one baby at a time, one family at a time, one community at a time. And we're going to win like we already are winning every single day. Damn straight. I love it. I, that is so amazing to hear about the, I guess, the, the invention, these new innovative ideas that you're having there in Houston, trying new things. I just love the phrases like, you know, they're using of we're creating a template, we're creating a model that other people can take and use and copy and improve upon in their areas. Like, I absolutely love that. That's exactly what we need more of in the pro-life movement. Uh, And I just love that you have that servant leader heart for this. How did you get involved in the pro-life movement? You know, it's amazing. I tell people this all the time. I hear the, I hear the conversation and, and, and Chris, and I can talk to you. I'm, you know, we're, we know each other. And they say, Sylvie, why aren't there many more black people involved in this? Well, in 1985, uh, there was a, a, a white lady that took me to lunch at Denny's over Denny's, brought this manual and gave me a pro-life one-on-one at Denny's. Okay. Then she takes me and tells me to follow her in her car and drives to the abortion clinic in the town I was living in. To my dismay and surprise, that abortion clinic was in my neighborhood. Here I am going to church every Sunday. My husband and our kids, we're passing by this abortion clinic. We're clueless as to what was going on right in our neighborhood. 
I had never heard a pro-life sermon. My minister never preached on it. But of course, you know, people were telling us, well, we don't really do that to our babies. No, other people do that. But that was a lie. And it just really shocked me to see what was going on right in my community. And I remember the, the stories about the Christians doing slavery. And I remember the stories about the Christians doing the Holocaust. And as a Christian, I can't sit by and allow this to continue. I must be, do something about it. And um, and I'm glad that I was called and I was prompted. And this little lady, Petey Tennyson, she's with the Lord now, invested in a lunch at Denny's that propelled me into the greatest work that I think that um, I could ever do it with my life. So I've been dedicated to it ever since then. That's amazing. I, I'm I'm so yeah. glad to, I'm so grateful for that one lady who took you, the big spender who took you out to Denny's. Um, to, to invest in you and to bring you along in this movement. I think when we ask that, that question gets asked a lot about like, well, how do we get more African-Americans? How do we get more blacks? How do we get more space in the public movement? It's very simple. The answer is just ask them um, to get involved. And I think it, sometimes we just don't ask people to get involved. We don't sit down and have that conversation with them. Um, of asking people to get involved in the pro-life movement. I'm so glad. I think we're all, after listening to this, everyone who can agree, we're all very glad that, that she took you out to Denny's. Although I would advocate maybe for like a step up to like Cracker Barrel or something like that. But um, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't as fancy was as La Madeline. That's where we went. But uh, $15 <laughs> for your for your eggs. That didn't taste so great. But anyway, uh, so what is your advice um, for pregnancy centers? I, you know, in this post row era, obviously innovate, develop new models, figure out how to attack the chemical abortion cartel. That's critical. Like everybody, I don't care if you're in a red or blue state. Like that's what the entire. I mean, I've been sounding alarmless in the pro life movement. I, I swear, I probably have done like 15 episodes exclusively pro life at this point, just on chemical abortion. Folks are probably sick of it, but we have to keep t continue talking about because it's the majority of abortions. Beyond that, what is your advice for um, pregnancy centers in midst of all the hatred that they're seeing? We have had, you know, over 100 churches and pregnancy centers been vandalized since May 2nd, since the Dobbs leak, then since the eventual Dobbs decision. Um, I have seen some things of like pregnancy centers not coming into work for a week or taking down their signs advertise, that advertise what they do. What is your message to pregnancy centers when they come under, under attack? Okay, I think the first thing we need to understand is know your enemy, know who they are, know how they act, know how they operate. They're undercover, they're, they are threatened by authority. And one of the first thing we did is I hired an a security company that had only six feet tall Nigerians that protected our pregnancy center and our events. And I want to tell you, I had no trouble at all in Houston, Texas, because mama don't play, Sylvia don't play. The other thing is you, you stand courageous in your truth. You stand courageous. The Lord is on your side. What we have is prayer. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Lord on our side. We have truth on our side. I am not going to cower down to that enemy. And yes, I got threats. As a matter of fact, we had, um, and, and I have to tell you this, Kristen, you may have to edit this out, but we had three, um, um, and please, I want y'all to know that I love the Lord. I love people. I love all people. You don't know me, but I love all people. We had three white ladies that came in the hood. Now I'm in the third ward of Houston, Texas, to try and stop women from coming through our doors. I went out there. You know what I said to those three white ladies? I said, you are the face of the new Ku Klux Klan. And I have it on video. <laughs> when I told them, and when I told when I told those ladies and I said, they said, oh, they went freaked out. I said, you want black babies to die. That's what I told them. That is what I told them. And I opened my mouth and I shouted it loud. I said, you are angry because Roe versus Wade overturned because your desire is for black babies to die. They looked at me and you know what they told me? We are Christians. I said, you serve Moloch, the God of babies that sacrifice children. I haven't seen those ladies since. They haven't been back. Good for you, woman. Okay. A lot of people who were in the Ku Klux Klan, leaders in the Ku Klux Klan, were deacons and elders in their church, too. Right. I think people right. tend people to forget, tend to forget that, that those who were leaders in the Ku Klux Klan were self-proclaimed Christians and were active in their faith communities.
Yeah. And that's how I see them. I see anybody who wants this abortion agenda to go headstrong, strong, fast in Georgia and everywhere else in communities where there's mostly minority women. I see them as the face of the new Ku Klux Klan. And I can't change that thought, you know, no matter what. The bottom line is a child dies, an innocent baby dies, generations are wiped out, children are gone. And there's something better that we can do to help moms and dads and families. We are supposed to be our brother's keeper. We are supposed to help women in those situations. The answer is not to kill the baby. The answer is to help the mother and those families. Absolutely, absolutely right. I just wish I could call every person who advocates for abortion part of the new Ku Klux Klan because I think they would just start screaming at me um, even louder and calling me a racist. I, I don't, two white people calling each other as racist isn't going to work. Or uh, me going, well, my black friend Sylvia says that you are racist. Uh, it's not, it's not going to go over really well. Um, but I mean, I think that I think what that story speaks to not only your courageousness and not only the fact that, you know, as a pregnancy center director, you're not taking it. You're just not going to deal with it. You've hired security. You've gone out there, confronted those protesters. They want you scared them off, woman. Um, congratulations. But I think it also speaks to the power of having black and brown voices speaking up in the pro-life movement. Um, for me, I think it's been one of the challenges that Students for Life personally, I think we talked about this a little bit. I have seen a lot of Hispanic students get involved in Students for Life, whether especially in states, you know, with, with higher Hispanic populations like Texas and California. But we haven't seen that translate in in the black community. And it's it's been a challenge. We've gone on to HBCUs and we've tried to start pro-life groups. And then we thought, well, we will stop calling them pro-life groups because pro-life sounds like it's Republican in a lot of folks' minds. So we it was like life is beautiful clubs and uh, those didn't work. And so it's just we've I mean, we're constantly trying to find better ways. But um, I would love your tips um, from a black person to a white person. What am I doing wrong? What can we do better in the pro-life movement to reach into to the black community and lift up voices, you know, educate, bring along, mentor, you know, black leaders in the pro-life movement? I think, Kristen, I want to tell you, you're doing everything right. You're courageous. The intelligence that God has gifted you with, the words of wisdom that 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 come from you when you're challenged, the way you stand up to criticism and, and crowds just hostile environments. You are an inspiration to anybody, everybody that is a Christian and that, that are pro-life. But remember, Margaret Sanger had a very important command. You get to the black pastor. If you get to him, you got us. And you know what? That hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. Now, there are a lot of black churches that fortunately support our ministry from day one, and they're here with us. They dedicate our babies. They marry our couples, and they support our families. But there is more pastors in Houston that's preaching the abortion and encouraging their members to vote abortion candidates in than anyone else. So her message to that community has not changed, has not changed. And I see it every day. And um, and I'm challenged by that. I'm challenged by even the, I don't even understand why they attach the word faith or pastor or reverend to their names because of the, um, because of the, uh, of what abortion really is. And they know what it is. They know what it is. Yeah. So continue to pray for my community, pray for all of the communities that, that uh, pastors will be convicted and, uh, leaders will be convicted to do what's right. You know, that almighty dollar is a mighty thing. And when you're doing a lot of abortions on in our community, the abortion clinics are located in our community, and you're doing the abortions on a lot of our women, some of that money trickles down to political um, campaigns and to candidates. So they're obligated to go out and preach that message, unfortunately. I think you're right on. I was talking to uh, Dean Nelson, a very good friend of mine. He's the founder of uh, Douglas Leadership Institute. You, you know Dean. He, I think he mentioned you to me the other, other day. I was like, I know Sylvia. Um, uh, but he and I were talking about the, the amendment defeat in Michigan and how he went into a very powerful uh, black uh, 
Christian faith leader. I think he was a bishop um, and started talking to him right before the vote. And he was like, I, I asked him, I said, do you think that the pro-life movement actually had reached out to him before knowing his prominence, his influence level? And D was like, no, absolutely not. He barely wow. even knew what it was about. And I, I wonder like, is that, I think there's this natural reaction if you're a white pro-lifer that you just need to don't talk to black people about abortion because whatever, they'll call you racist. But I feel like if, if, if it's just you and four other folks in Allentown, Pennsylvania, if you're working on our campaign for abortion free cities, which they do a great job. So shout out to Allentown. Um, and I don't know the makeup of that group, but if they're all white, you should still go and approach the black pastor. I feel like we, we tend to like, Oh, we're not black. So therefore we can't go to the black church. Like, no, like the, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Like go have the conversation. Right. We're not racist in the pro-life movement. Have never been. If anything, you know, we're that's not how we see people. We see unborn children. We see mothers that need help, regardless of the color of their skin. And I love this about our belief system. So I am not going to play into their racism, and I'm not going to um, uh, um, bow down to it. I am going to stick with the subject and the matter of hand that children were created in the image of God, regardless of what happened. And what we should do is everything that we can within our power to protect that unborn life, give that mother support, work with that young father and, and build stronger communities, build stronger families, because everything um, on the other side is against that family unit. And we can go into a whole lot of different conversations about that, but we see the attack against that family unit and abortion is one of the strongest, strongest divider in family units right now. There are people missing in my family because of abortion. My family reunion have missing people because of abortion. So we've all we've all been affected by it in some way. Who's missing at our get togethers uh, at the Thanksgiving dinner table, the Christmas Eve dinner table? You know, you've served 35 years, seeing 10,000 clients a year. I mean, you have served 350,000 people roughly in your tenure in the pro-life movement. So you know what you're talking about. What, Sylvia, as your parting words of wisdom, what do you want pro-lifers, especially younger pro-lifers, um, who maybe just get, or, or maybe pro-lifers who are older, but just getting their start in the pro-life movement, what do you want them to know and take away from this podcast? As you know, as you're this leader there in Houston, saving lives, serving mothers, what do you wish that everyone listening would leave knowing? The greatest weapon we have is the power of prayer. The other side doesn't have that. That is what we've been given as a gift. Utilize the power of prayer. Utilize your faith in God. Utilize the wisdom that the Holy Spirit will give you to give you innovation and vision and insight into what you can do. One, you, one person can do to impact the life of children and impact the message of being total life, pro-life for other children, other, other families. Don't forget, we have what they don't have, and that's the power of prayer. Don't make any apologies for the God you serve and who you believe in. Don't ever back down from that. Use the courage and the strength that God has given you and stand strong on it. Wave that battle flag and don't give up. Don't give an inch up. Mm -hmm. Amen. I, Sylvia, this is why I've been waiting to have you on this podcast. Um, I I so much enjoyed actually getting to meet you in person. And then I get so tickled when people bring you up as this leader leading, you know, this new wave of the pro-life movement. And I'm like, I know her, I know what she's doing. Um, and so I, I love that so many are seeing your work there in Houston. They're really, you know, in the black community, downtown, in the hood, as you put it, uh, which I need to learn about this new social media internet in the hood that Students for Life needs to partake in that. How do we get involved in that? But, um, the, I, I just love that. And I love that what you're doing is, is making waves where folks across the country are, are talking about, did you hear what Greater Houston Pregnancy Center is doing? Did you hear what this lady, Sylvia, is doing and really trying to adapt your model and your innovation 
for their own communities. That is what we need more of uh, in the pro-life movement, especially now in this post-war era where everything has sped up and our fight is so much greater to make abortion unthinkable. And that that's, that so much starts with the pregnancy center movement, the front lines, the social services we're, su- we're supporting, sustaining, and promoting those resources in our communities. And Sylvia, you are just, you're just a hero amongst so many heroes. It's so great to, to have you on the podcast. Where can folks go to support your ministry, to learn more about what you're doing, or just, you know, get more Sylvia-isms? Because I have a feeling that uh, video of you confronting those protesters, there's probably more of that somewhere that I need to find. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And the first thing I want to say is thank you so much to God be the glory for all that he's called me to do. I love it. And you know what, Kristen, I want to do more. I am looking for more opportunities to save more babies, to help more mamas. Um, I am not getting tired at all, but you can go to our website, fifthward.org uh, is our website. And um, it uh, tells a lot about what we're doing and any opportunities that I can have that pray for me, that I will not grow weary and well-doing, that I will continue to trust in the Lord and that he will continue to enable me to do more every single day. I work with an amazing team. I have an amazing board of directors that's very focused on um, saving babies every day and serving mamas every day. And so I'm excited to, to be where I am and at this time. So thank you so much for the example that you set for me. Sylvia wants to do more and will travel. So I have written this down in my notes. So just be prepared when Kristen comes knocking because I have some ideas percolating in my mind about how we can get you out there across the country because we need you everywhere. So thank you all for, for, for coming today, uh, listening to this conversation amongst friends. I hope you all were encouraged about Sylvia and her mission and what they're doing and what the pro-life movement is doing in Texas, and especially in Houston, uh, amongst the black community. Um, and hopefully this encourages you to speak out, be bold. I don't care what your gender is. Uh, there are two, your race, uh, there are many, uh, what your faith is, you can get involved in the pro-life movement. You can save lives today. Don't be afraid. Be bold like Sylvia. Thanks for tuning in. See you next week.